This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of February 13th, 2022. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 225 and happy Valentine's Day. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. The Is It Just Me commentary. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And the Big Deal feature. BC Liberal Kevin Falcon is on a comeback. BC's legislature is back, and the Greens have tough questions for the governing NDP. Meanwhile, gridlock of a different sort on Parliament Hill. Convoy chaos in the capital with pandemic protests. Here sounds from the week that was. But first, is it just me? Is it just me, or has Canada ever been as divided as it is now, and will there ever be national unity? Two years after the far left had its shutdown Canada, the far right now has the trucker's convoy, and most of us are stuck in the middle. Shutdown Canada was an anti-pipeline campaign aimed to shut down Canada's economy, It leveraged the simmering dispute between factions of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation and an LNG company building a pipeline in northern British Columbia. Roads, railways, bridges, ports, and ferry terminals were targeted. Even the BC legislature was surrounded. The movement distracted governments during the early days of the virus in January and February 2020 and fizzled out just in time for the pandemic to be declared in March 2020. That's when the precursor to the truckers' convoy began to fester. Groups in Toronto and Vancouver, allied with the QAnon cult, peddled the message that the coronavirus was as dangerous as the flu, and the real danger was the vaccine. Canadians have legitimate reasons to be unhappy with the performance of their politicians, including those that used the pandemic to grab more power. Hello, Justin Trudeau. Hello, John Horgan. The truth is, the virus is deadly and vaccines are necessary. But they are not the be-all and end-all. At least 3.1 million Canadians have tested positive, and more than 35,000 have died of the coronavirus. The real numbers? They're probably double, if not triple. The virus is expected to become endemic in the months to come, but what will become of the radical left and the radical right protest movements that are like bookends of this pandemic? What do you think? Email bob at thebreaker.news. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. Eleven years after his first try, Kevin Falcon finally became BC Liberal Party leader, vowing to rebuild the party, rename it too, and bring it back to power. It was a leadership race that was fraught with controversy and allegations that Falcon's team cheated by signing up thousands of fraudulent memberships in Surrey and Abbotsford. Falcon eventually won on the fifth ballot over Ellis Ross. Here's a clip of Falcon's victory speech from February 5th. Trust in politics and politicians has never been lower. Politicians make all kinds of promises, but so often nothing actually gets done. And some people feel polarized, some are apathetic, and so many more are just disillusioned with the entire political process. There is a desire like I've never seen before for candor, for competence, and for leadership. And there is also a desire for leaders who will bring people together and who recognize that while we might mightily disagree about policy, we can do so without making it personal. While the fraud and breach of trust trial of ex-clerk Craig James continued in Vancouver, the spring session of the B.C. legislature got underway in Victoria on February 8th. Premier John Horgan returned to the legislature from throat cancer treatment, and the throne speech began with a blooper by Lieutenant Governor Janet Austin as she began to read the NDP government's blueprint, which didn't have much new to it, except there will be a couple of ministries being reorganized. Honourable Speaker and members of the Legislative Assembly, in closing... Oh. (laughs) Can't believe I did that. was a short session. (laughs) I can't believe I did that. I'm human. (laughs) All right. right. Uh, Take two. (laughs) 
Yeah. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Mr. Speaker and honourable members. A Premier, welcome back. We are all so, so, so very pleased to see you today. Later in the week, Green Party leader Sonia Firstnow challenged Health Minister Adrian Dix about the BC government's stubborn reluctance to adopt scientific findings about how COVID-19 is spread. My question for you, Honourable Speaker, is to the Minister of Health. Does he agree with the World Health Organization that COVID is an airborne virus? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I think uh, the member will know uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Dr. Henry, our public health teams, the Ministry of Health, have consistently advised people that outdoors is safer than indoors, that we need to take specific action to ensure that people are protected indoors. And that's why we've had all of the measures that have happened over time, including a mask mandate that continues to this day, including the BC vaccine card that continues to this day and will continue for some months to come, that includes other public health measures to limit capacity and to limit transmission. Meanwhile, the other Green member in the legislature, Adam Olson, asked Speaker Raj Chohan to investigate Citizens Services Minister Lisa Baer for contempt of Parliament. Evidence shows that Lisa Baer deliberately misled lawmakers about imposing a $10 Freedom of Information application fee at the end of the fall session. It is the intentional attempt to mislead the House the interference in our parliamentary work that is an affront to the dignity and authority of this parliament, this house, and the obstruction of the performance of the function of this house that must be investigated further. Questions have been raised publicly by elected members and members of the legislative press gallery with respect to whether responses to questions by the Minister of Citizen Services at committee stage of debate for Bill 22 the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Amendment Act 2021 amounted to an intentional attempt to mislead this House. If a member of the Crown intentionally misleads this House, or if allegations are made publicly that a minister intentionally misled the House, and it's allowed to stand without further investigation, it undermines and erodes the confidence of our constituents in their members and ultimately calls into question the dignity of this institution. Lisa Baer, the Citizens Services Minister accused of contempt of Parliament, spoke in her defence on February 10th. Minister for Citizens Services. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Um, the members opposite have, uh, I'm uh, taking my chance to respond uh, right now. Thank you, Speaker. So the members opposite have misrepresented what was said in this House and the correct steps that were taken in regards to implementing the fee. Bill 22 enabled the creation of the fee. It did not set the fee. This was done through regulation, and Cabinet could not and did not approve the application fee regulation until after the bill received royal assent, which occurred on November 25th. While interim approvals are given at many points in the process of preparing materials for final minister decision, no decision is final until the OIC is approved by the minister and subsequently by Cabinet. It is a matter of public record that I approved the OIC with the application fee amount after the bill had received royal assent on November 25th and that it was approved by Cabinet on November 26th. The application fee amount in, uh, includes consideration of what I heard from stakeholders, the opposition, the public, the media, while the bill was progressing through the House. My commitment in the House was that I was listening to feedback. The quotes raised yesterday by the members support that. My commitment to listen has been met. And as I've outlined, no final decision could have been or was made regarding the application fee amount until after royal assent. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, for your consideration. And please note, I will table some documents. Thank you. Meanwhile, drama in Ontario, where truckers occupied streets around Ottawa and blocked the border between Windsor and Detroit. They say they're against vaccine mandates and masks. They want governments to stop them immediately. Raquel Dancho, a Conservative MP from Kildonan and St. Paul, Manitoba, spoke passionately in the House of Commons about the crisis of division in Canada and the toll the pandemic has taken. What I'd really like to see is a Prime Minister who calls for national unity. Last week I spoke in the House about a lot of the division that we're seeing in the country between East versus West, rural versus urban, and particularly now during the pandemic. And 
we have heard so much trauma from our constituents. If there's any member in this house that does not believe Canadians have been through trauma these past two years, they clearly have not been doing their job and listening to their constituents, Mr. Speaker. It has been horrific, the things that I've heard. We hear young children who are so depressed they don't want to eat. Eating disorders are through the roof. We've heard seniors and elderly in our care homes who've opted for medical assistance in dying rather than live one more month through isolation in care homes. I have had widowed elderly women call and cry to me on the phone of how lonely they are and they don't want to go on. I've had grown men who've called me crying because their businesses are falling apart. We know divorces, abuse at home, alcohol dependency, drug dependency, all of these terrible things are up in our country because people are just trying to cope and are breaking down. So from that perspective, I don't really see what's going on across the country is all that surprising. To me, it seems like an eruption of something that's been simmering of pain and trauma and frustration for two long years. And governments have not been listening to that pain and trauma despite having rapid test vaccines and all different types of tools and scientific knowledge. Governments have repeatedly, repeatedly relied on harsh laws lockdown measures and divisive mandates to control this virus. Meanwhile, we are seeing a Prime Minister who today got up in the House and again, again othered Canadians who don't agree with him. This is a man for six years said diversity is our strength, but if anybody doesn't agree with everything he says, you're in the bad books and you don't get a chance to be heard. You don't have a right to be heard. Hey. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said February 11th that he had spoken with U.S. President Joe Biden about finding a solution. We discussed the American and indeed global influences on the protest. We talked about the U.S.-based flooding of the 911 phone lines in Ottawa, the presence of U.S. citizens in the blockades, and the impact of foreign money to fund this illegal activity. Everything is on the table because this unlawful activity has to end, and it will end. Of course, I can't say too much more now as to exactly when or how this ends because unfortunately we are concerned about violence. So we're taking every precaution to keep people safe. But the absolute safest way for this to end is for everyone to return to your communities now. But we are a long way from ever having to call in the military, although of course, we have to be uh, ready for any eventuality, uh, but uh, it is not something we are seriously contemplating at this time. On the same day, Ontario Premier Doug Ford vowed to crack down. We're now two weeks into the siege of the city of Ottawa. I call it a siege because that's what it is. It's an illegal occupation. This is no longer a protest. With a protest, you peacefully make your point and you go back home. And I know that the vast majority of the people did that. They came, they peacefully demonstrated, they made their point, and they left. And I want to say to those people, you've been heard loud and clear. Canada has heard you. My message to those still in Ottawa, to those at our border crossings, please go home. Today, I'm using my authority as Premier of Ontario to declare a state of emergency in our province. And I will convene Cabinet to use legal authorities to urgently enact orders that will make crystal clear it is illegal and punishable to block and impede the movement of goods, people and services along critical infrastructure. On the morning of February 12th, police moved in to end the Ambassador Bridge border blockade. Meanwhile, protests have continued at other border stops across the country on the same day at the Pacific border crossing in British Columbia.
Those are the sounds of the February 12th protest that blocked the Pacific border crossing between Surrey, B.C. and Blaine, Washington, courtesy of Pro Picks Canada Media Limited and Mr. Sunshine Baby, both on YouTube. Around 2,000 people flooded the highway and blocked access after a convoy of trucks arrived from Chilliwack. Protests have taken place from New Brunswick all the way to Vancouver. How will it end? Or is this just the start of something else? News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In the Taiwan news, Eileen Gu has Marie Antoinette moment. The teenage big air gold medalist from the U.S. chose to compete for China. Gu boasted about her easy access to virtual private networks to get around China's internet censorship, a privilege that common Chinese don't have. Artist Badiu Chao said she brushes away brutal reality of ordinary Chinese and slides into Chinese propaganda. The dissident artist posted his latest poster depicting Gu biting into a gold medal on a podium made of the backs of three handcuffed Uyghurs. In Hong Kong Free Press, full lockdown urged as Hong Kong University predicts 28,000 daily cases, government officials to meet mainland authorities. Hong Kong health system overloaded, 40 medical staff test preliminary positive as city records more than 1,300 new cases. Professor Jeff Wu predicted nearly 1,000 deaths by mid-June. In the Korea Herald, test, trace, treat must go on, says ex-Korea CDC chief. Flu comparisons misleading, Omicron likely as severe as the original Wuhan virus. Dr. Lee jong koo said vaccine effectiveness wanes after six months, so other measures must still be used to fight the virus. In Mainichi News, doll ban means no Winnie the Pooh shower for Yuzuru Hanyu at Beijing Olympics. Two-time Olympic figure skating defending champion Yuzuru Hanyu loves Winnie the Pooh. And that's well known because fans throw stuffed Pooh bears onto the rink after his performances. But that may not be the case at the Beijing Winter Olympics where guests to figure skating venue Capital Indoor Stadium are banned from bringing stuffed animals. Regular tickets to the Beijing Olympics were not made available for sale and only invited guests can watch the events live at the venues. Winnie the Pooh is also a well-known online metaphor for Xi Jinping on Chinese social media. In ABC News Australia, China behind failed attempt to bankroll Labour candidates in federal election. A business figure in Australia with deep ties to China acted as a puppeteer to finance potential federal Labour candidates sympathetic to Beijing. That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In the Oregonian, Portland Pickles mascot, known for Twitter jokes and lewd photo, disappears in failed delivery. Dylan T. Pickle, the mascot of the Portland Pickles baseball team, is missing, and the team management swears it's not a joke. They say he was stolen from the front porch of their office after first being lost by Delta Airlines. Portland police have no suspects and no arrests have been made. In the Seattle Times, Seattle man sentenced to six months for punching officers in January 6th insurrection. Mark Jefferson Leffingwell, 52, a former member of the Washington National Guard, appeared by video from Seattle for his sentencing before U.S. District Court Judge Amy B. Jackson in the District of Columbia. In the Bellingham Herald, mysterious glitch traps some Mazda drivers on Washington public radio station. A radio station in the Seattle area sent image files with no extension, which caused an issue on some 2014 to 2017 Mazda vehicles with older software. Mazda North American Operations has distributed service alerts advising dealers of the issue. The biggest sports superstar in Cascadia, Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson, is coming to Vancouver on April 26th. Get in the huddle at the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association Annual Banquet. For information and tickets, go to icba.ca or call toll-free 1-800-663-2865. And it don't matter what color you are, cause love will conquer hate, so you won't stand alone, you won't stand alone. The Virtual Nanaimo Bar. Brought to you by Spruce.
Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to Chambers of Commerce, the community hubs for small business around the province. It's Chamber of Commerce week in BC from February 14th to 18th. You can nominate someone for a virtual Nanaimo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. Vaccine, 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 vaccine. Because once you're dead, then that's a bit too late. (laughs) I know I'm trying to be funny now, but I'm dead serious about the vaccine. I think we all want to get back to normal, whatever that is. And that would be a great shot in the arm, wouldn't it? That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of February 13th, 2022. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 13th of February in 1913, the 13th Dalai Lama declared Tibetan independence? It lasted four decades until the Chinese communists cracked down. Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit TheBreaker.News on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to Patreon.com slash TheBreakerNews. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash TheBreakerNews. Happy Valentine's Day. Until next week.